Good morning guys and happy Easter weekend to everyone out there who celebrates. I am truly ashamed of how much chocolate I've eaten so far and it's only Saturday. I've one left which is my absolute favourite, the white chocolate butler's bunny. So once I force feed that to myself tomorrow morning, no doubt for breakfast, I am off sugar until Christmas, I swear to God. So now let's talk about today's case. And yeah, I said case because in addition to being a reality TV fanatic, I'm also a true crime serial watcher. And I have been since very early childhood. And you're probably like, what? Yeah, listen, parenting was more chill in the 80s. Okay, so (laughs) I was trawling through, you know, the on demand box sets on Sky of all the old cold case files on the crime channels and I was looking for something that A I hadn't heard of and B that didn't really have anything sexual in nature because I just I wasn't really in the headspace for that. So I ended up landing on the case of John and Judy Parker and what do you know it coincidentally happened on Easter weekend. I mean talk about meant to be. So I've titled this video Behind Closed Doors because From the outside, John and Judy Parker were this picture perfect couple. They both came from really humble beginnings and they really now seem to be living their American dream. They had four kids. The kids wore lovely clothes, attended a good school. John and Judy worked together side by side in this successful business that they built together from the ground up. And they lived in the nice house, the good side of town in, I think it was Merrillville, Indiana. They drove a good car. John wore a Rolex. I mean, life just looked good for the Packers and particularly to people on the outside looking in. And this all ended on Easter weekend 2003 because the couple said goodbye to their four kids. They went out to a nice local restaurant for dinner, but only one of them came home. And this is because a seemingly random act of violence resulted in murder. And was it just a robbery gone wrong? You know, as it first kind of appeared when the police arrived on scene. No, not so much. And as it turns out, there was nothing at all random about this night. So before we get into the case, I just want to say officially welcome to the criminal sport where I'm going to explore some true crime in bite-sized form. So anyone like me who loves true crime will know that true crime comes in many shapes and sizes and it is absolutely, most definitely not one size fits all. So sometimes the content can be a little bit upsetting or even disturbing for some of us. And look, if it's not the kind of content for you, by all means, go ahead and press skip on this one. But do check out some of our reality TV reviews because they're far lighter, much less stabby and you never know, you might enjoy them. If you do, however, like this kind of content, go ahead, like, subscribe, follow, whatever all the things are now so that I know whether or not to make more videos like this or if I have just traumatized you and chased you away. So (laughs) without further ado, let's talk about today's case. So let's go ahead and start with Judy, okay? So Judy was born in Texas in 1969. Her family didn't have a lot of money. They lived a pretty simple life, I would say, in a pretty modest house. And at 14, this blew my mind, at 14, her parents gave their consent for Judy to go and get married to her first husband, Roy. Now, just let that sink in. Granted, you know, I was joking earlier on about it being a different time parenting wise, you know, in the 80s. But 1969 is not that long ago. When I think of my mom, she was born in 1970. And the thought of her getting married at 14 is still really, really bloody weird. So the thoughts of a little 14 year old being a wife and a mother, it's, it's a lot. So anyway, she marries Roy and they have two children together called Christina and Daniel. And it wasn't exactly this fairy tale happy ending. The marriage wasn't great, okay? It was quite turbulent. It didn't last long. And are we surprised? I mean, these are these are kids getting married and playing house. When I think of my boyfriend when I was 14, we had, I'm pretty sure it led to our breakup argument, but we had gone to the cinema. I can't even tell the story with a straight face. We had gone to the cinema. Yeah, I think it was, you know, you know, he had purchased the tickets and I had purchased the sweets and we were sharing our popcorn, being awfully romantic as 14 year olds do. And then at one point he must have gone out to the toilet and gone back to the concession and bought like a pack of Revels, you know, like the share size Revels. But he came back and tried to eat the Revels out of his hoodie pocket as though 
I wasn't going to realize that he had contraband in there. And he basically just didn't want to share his rebels. And this led to a massive argument between two very dramatic 14 year olds on the importance of sharing and how terrible it is to be selfish in a relationship. Like when you think that there are children starving in the world, here are these two little assholes in a cinema arguing. But the point I'm trying to make is that that was the level of maturity I was dealing with at 14 in a relationship. So the thoughts of being married with children at that age is terrifying. And suffice to say, this marriage didn't last very long. It was quite turbulent. It was quite rocky from the get-go. And by the age of 20, Judy found herself divorced with two small children to support as a single mom. And you know something? She got out there. She made shit happen. She worked her backside off and made ends meet. And I just think at 20 years old, you've gone through all of that and you're so switched on, so unbelievably impressive. And she worked a few different jobs, but she kind of found her way into sales because sales was like a natural ability. And I always think people who are naturally good at sales could just rule the world. But here she was, 20 years old, hungry for success and just ready to make shit happen. And she found a job selling these Kirby vacuums. Now, I'd never heard of these Kirby vacuums. I don't know if it's just that it's before my time or maybe they weren't really popular over here. They were more of an American thing. But in my head, I'm equating it to like the Dyson of today. <laughs> and going and finding this position selling Kirby vacuums was actually how she came to meet John Parker. So John Parker had grown up, I believe, in Michigan. And he was born in 1970, so they were very close in age. And he grew up with slightly more than Judy did. He came still from a relatively humble background, but he came from a very, very strict household. The parents were very into discipline, very into accountability. So I suppose in that way, John and Judy had that in common. They both kind of had to be mature and accountable quite young, you know, both in very different ways, mind you, but they obviously had that in common. And much like Judy, John was a very ambitious kind of go-getter. He left school, he left high school and didn't go down the college route. He started working straight away, but he wasn't really cut out to be an employee. He was much more comfortable at being the boss and being in charge. And he became a vacuum salesman, much to the amusement of his brother. But actually, the naysayers weren't laughing for long because John was killing it with sales. Like he outsold everybody on his team. Here he is, the young whippersnapper, and he was showing them how it was done. And this just fed John's confidence, his ego. He was a little bit of a showman. You know, those people who kind of win, 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 and they like to let everybody know that they were the winner, rubbing faces in it, that kind of attitude. So every sales drive there was, every kind of competition or sales incentive there was in work, John would be on top of the leaderboard and he would not be afraid to let everybody know that he was number one. And also, the kind of stuff that he was winning for these, you know, sales incentives for selling Hoovers, it was everything from like cash to Harley Davidson motorcycles. Like what the hell? Like how much money is there in vacuums? I'm starting to rethink my whole career path. But anyway, the money was rolling in is the point. So naturally he decided, screw this. I'm not working for someone else. I am going out on my own. And then he developed his own um, like signature sales techniques and he taught it to the people working for him, which is somewhere between like multi-level marketing strategy, in my opinion. But honestly, he just sounded like the Jordan Belfort of Hoover's. So things were going very well for John. And on one day in his own store in Michigan, Judy walks in and Judy's looking for a job. And he kind of declines her at first, fobs her off and says, you know, there's no openings. But Judy doesn't take the no and leave. She kind of just stands her ground and she tells him, you know, you want me on this team. I will outsell anyone in here. And of course, this is going to grab John's attention because this is his jam. This is the kind of person he is. And he couldn't say no. This gusto was just, he saw something in her and he gave her his card and the rest is history. So they started working alongside each other and true to her word, she was fantastic at the job. 
And it wasn't long before John kind of noticed her and thought, you know what, she's fantastic at everything. She's just pure fantastic all around. And he was so into Judy and they became an item pretty quickly. Things started to progress and I mean, they had a lot of common ground. They were very similar personality wise. They shared a lot of common goals and ambitions for the future and John really wanted a family. Judy obviously had Christina and Daniel already but she so badly wanted to provide them with that father figure who was there, who was present in their day-to-day life. She wanted to give them financial stability as well. So I mean... John, of course, embraced Christina and Daniel completely and Judy loved him for loving her kids and the kids were happy and it was just this lovely natural fit. It all came together and John and Judy get married and they officially become the Parker family. And the Parker family, and I'm doing the little bunny ears air quotes, the Parker family nearly becomes a marketing tool in and of itself. So this picture perfect image of this happy, successful, thriving family, John nearly uses that as his own PR and image becomes really, really important. It's already something that John takes very seriously. He's a businessman. However, it starts to get a little bit out of hand and it becomes so much about appearances and there is so much importance and emphasis placed on always smiling, looking happy and putting your best foot forward into the world. So let's just leave that there for a moment. And John and Judy, they decide that they're going to expand their family. So they add two more to their brood. They have Erica and they have Tiffany. So now they have four kids all together. And they decide that they're going to create this new company that will be John and Judy together. So they call it J&J Parker Limited. And the family is, of course, the face of this company. And keeping up appearances becomes, you know, everybody's burden, shall we say. And the kids are kind of, they're very aware of this. They're very aware of the parts that they have to play. And it becomes almost a little sick in that, John kind of reminds the kids of what they have and how, you know, if you want to keep this going, if you like all the nice things that you have, then you're going to play this game and you're going to smile and you're going to tell everybody that everything is great. And spoiler alert, it wasn't great. Behind closed doors, it was absolutely not great. And the kids were brought to Texas. So John, Judy, pack up the car, put the kids in and they go and they visit. They do like a drive by of Judy's childhood home, which I've said before, she came from a really humble, modest background, which I mean, is probably a very kind way of putting it. She didn't come from a lot. So they go to visit the old house. They can't go in or anything, but they can show the kids. So this is where Mammy grew up. And the kids are like, whoa, like that was your house. And John kind of seizes on this moment. He uses it as a way to instill fear in the kids and kind of gives them a chilling warning that if you don't want to live in a house like that, like if you want to stay in the nice house and you want to have all your toys and all your nice things, then you all better learn to smile and keep your mouths shut. Because if our family was to ever break apart, you would lose everything that you have. And you're probably wondering at this stage, what is going on? So what is it that they have to keep their mouths shut about? Well, funnily enough, Judy actually confides in her brother while they're on this same trip to Texas. And she spills the beans and kind of says, listen, things are not great. They're not all that they seem. John is kind of changing a little bit. He's becoming extremely controlling. He's becoming really strict on the kids, really harsh on the kids. I don't know how to manage this. I don't know how to get through to him. But she basically gives the brother a little bit of insight into what is going on. And the brother is shocked because he was so happy when John, Judy and the kids arrived. He saw his sister. She looks like she's really made it. She's got the husband. She's got the kids. She's in nice clothes. And he kind of thought, I'm really happy for my sister. Look, we came from this really, really modest background. And here she is. She's made it. She has nice things and she seems really happy. So the brother is sitting there listening to Judy drop all of this information on him and he's in shock and it keeps going and Judy tells the brother that he started to drink a lot and that he's starting to become quite financially controlling and he's kind of nearly threatening Judy a little bit you know if you ever leave me you'll leave with nothing that kind of thing 
So all of these things are, are painting a very disturbing picture and they don't just start overnight. You know, these are obviously things that have been going on and that Judy has not really spoken out on. So the brother is just taking this in and it, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. So next she starts talking about more specific occurrences that have happened with the kids. So Christina and Daniel, her two oldest children, she's telling the brother that, you know, they, they're they butting heads so much more with John. They're starting to feel as though they're being treated more harshly. The, that the younger kids, Tiffany and Erica, are getting more lenient treatment because they're John's biological children. And, you know, we're hearing that Daniel and Christina are starting to act out a bit more. I mean, they're coming into their teenage years. So, of course, to an extent, we can expect a little bit of rebellion from teenagers. But Judy's telling her brother that Christina and Daniel feel that it's more than that. They're starting to feel like they're kind of second class citizens when it comes to the kids. And the younger children have actually been interviewed and Tiffany in particular, she disagrees with this assessment and she recalls quite a disturbing incident where she, at I think she was only like 11 years old, she had forgotten to hand in a book report and the school called home to, you know, grass her up and John picked up the phone. And when he was given this news that his, you know, quote unquote, picture perfect family was failing somewhere or falling behind or not living up to the image that he wants them to live up to, he became enraged. He thanked the teacher, he put down the phone and then he walked straight into the dining room, snatched Tiffany out of her chair, threw her to the ground took off his belt and began to beat her in front of the entire family, including Judy. Now, can I just say, how as a mother do you stand there? And I'm not turning this around to be Judy's fault, okay? John is clearly an abusive piece of shit behind closed doors. But how do you stand by as a mother? And bearing in mind, this is definitely not the only incidents of physical abuse because even Daniel has reported incidences where John has gotten physical with him out of anger. So how do you stand there and watch your 11 year old daughter being beaten with a belt in front of the whole family because she didn't hand in a book report? I have no words for that. I don't know what that is but now it kind of puts things in a darker light, if you like. So thinking back to the kids seeing Judy's childhood home and John warning them, if you don't want to live in a home like that, then you're going to keep your mouths shut and you're going to smile. So that is exactly what he was getting at. Things were not just unpleasant behind closed doors. Things were downright abusive behind closed doors. But he had the kids really well trained into being afraid of what they could lose if they speak up. So things like this belt incident. Tiffany went into school and there were visible bruises all over her. And although the teachers did report this to CPS, she had already been coached to say it was her big brother, Daniel, and, you know, everything is fine. So he got away with it. He got away with it because he had scared his children into thinking that the alternative was a worse option. And I know that some people are probably thinking, well, like, not the end of the world. They, they'd rather be beaten than to lose their toys. And I don't think it's as simple as that. I think these kids have been pretty much brainwashed from a very early age, the two youngest kids from birth, that image is everything, their family Im image needs to be protected at all costs. And remember, Judy seems to be going along with this. So it's been completely normalised for these kids. And I just, it's really sad. It's really unfair. John is a piece of shit. And Judy, you know, there's parts of me that kind of want to say, oh God, she's in a situation now where she's got four kids instead of two. All of her assets are now intermingled with this piece of shit and all she ever really wanted was a financially stable and loving environment for her kids. But no, I think when you watch your 11 year old getting the shit beaten out of her with a belt in front of the entire family as they sit down to dinner, I mean, if it was me, poverty wouldn't seem that scary an option in that case. So I understand why the kids don't feel confident and safe enough to speak up but I absolutely do not understand why Judy is not taking any action at this point. So shortly after all of this goes down and they've done the trip to Texas and the brother is kind of somewhat in the know about what is going on, 
The Parkers decide it's time to leave Michigan and they kind of pick up and move themselves to Indiana and they move to this really affluent neighbourhood in Crown Point. And I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear that this wasn't some well thought out family decision that was democratically voted on. No, not at all. John had basically unilaterally decided on impulse that, do you know what, we're done here. We're cutting our ties and we're just going to close the business down. We're going to move the whole family to Indiana and we're just going to start fresh there and we're going to preserve our family image. And when I say that he made this decision on impulse, I mean it quite literally. Like he left a lot of long time loyal employees just jobless without any notice. Former employees even report that they just showed up to work one morning as normal and they were kind of told, hey, by the way, this is your last day. So you can leave now if you need to go and file unemployment. And they were like, what? the hell? Like, are you serious? Is this a sick joke? But no, that was how he basically told all of his longtime employees that you are no longer going to be working for this company. We're closing down and we're moving to a new state. I mean, just a gentleman. And some of the employees that have spoken on this, you know, they do note that he had gone so downhill. He was spinning out over the last couple of months, even up to a year before this news was delivered. He had become a lot more aggressive. He was shouting. He wasn't just shouting at them. He was shouting at Judy in front of them. The kids were always kind of around the office after school and, you know, they were being shouted at. Even customers were being shouted at. So the whole keeping up appearances had obviously started to fall a bit by the wayside. John was clearly going through some stuff and even his appearance was starting to reflect that. Like he was no longer this snappy suit, clean shaven guy. He was starting to look a bit disheveled and just like a far cry from the John Parker that everybody had come to know over the years. But actually, when he picked up the whole family and moved to Indiana with the intention of starting fresh and preserving what was left of their image, nothing really improved. If anything, he just continued to devolve. And business, as I said, it was not going well. Their budget was stretched as tight as it could. They were taken on staff and having to let them go just as quick. And he wasn't apologetic about this, John. Like, he didn't seem to care at all. He didn't handle it very delicately when you consider that this is people's livelihoods and there was one employee in particular whose productivity had dipped like very very slightly for one sales week and he let him go and then didn't pay him his wages and tried to say that the reason that he is withholding his wages is because he still has you know product so hoovers somewhere at home and this employee was like what are you talking about give me my money no I don't and this was just this massive blowout argument on the premises in front of everybody everybody saw this happen And J&J Parker Limited was just, they were completely up shit creek financially. They were about to file bankruptcy, which nobody really knew outside of the family. And John was no longer in a position where he could control this. He was completely himself out of control, the way he was flying off the handle, shouting at people, his own appearance. So it was almost like he was doubling down when it came to controlling his family, because that was the one thing that he still kind of felt he could have full control over. And it was too much. Judy and the kids were getting the brunt of every bad mood. They were paying for all of his stress. And all of the kids now were starting to act out. You know, there was drinking, there was smoking. There was even Tiffany, the younger daughter who had, you know, been beaten with a belt. Even she was starting to get in trouble at school, lighting fires with a friend. And it was just this vicious cycle. And Judy kind of said, right, we need to we need to talk about this. We need to figure out what we're going to do moving forward because this isn't sustainable. This isn't how a family should be. So Easter weekend 2003, two out of their four children were actually grounded. So perfect babysitters already at the ready. So Judy, you know, invites John out for dinner. They're going to go out and they're going to have a parenting talk. And they're going to decide between them what's the appropriate way to discipline the kids moving forward. And they go out, they have their talk, they have their dinner. And before they leave the restaurant to come home, Judy calls the house just to check in on the kids, make sure that everybody is okay. And she speaks to Christina. 
and Christina tells her, yeah, everything is fine here. But just a quick heads up, Tiffany was a little bit hysterical earlier because she realised that she left her homework in the office earlier on this evening and she's worried about what John is going to say when he finds out that she doesn't have it to hand in. Because we know that John doesn't like when the kids don't hand in their homework on time. So Judy's like, okay, listen, don't panic. We're driving past the office. One of the managers should still be there. We'll stop in. We'll pick up the homework. Problem solved. And she says to John, listen, Tiffany's really worried. She's left her homework at the office. We're driving by anyway. Can we just make a quick stop off? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. No problem. So they do. They stop off at J&J Parker Limited and the lights are still on. The office manager, Jeff, is still there. He's working late all the time because, you know, people just tend to get fired quite easily these days. And they both go in together. Now, John kind of gets sidetracked and he's talking to Jeff at the front desk. Judy goes off, gets the homework from wherever the hell it was left behind. She comes back out. She says goodnight to Jeff. He's still talking to John. And she says, John, I'm just going to wait in the car. I'll see you in a minute. So she goes out and sits in the car. John kind of stays for a few minutes. He's chatting to Jeff. Jeff mentions, God, you know, I haven't even had dinner. I'm so hungry. And you'd think a boss would kind of say, well, get out of here, go home, you know, stop burning the midnight oil. No, John says, well, actually, I've just been out for a nice dinner with the wife and I've got leftovers in the back seat. Do you want my leftovers? I'll go out and get them for you. I mean, what a dick, what a dick. But anyway, Jeff is so hungry, he doesn't even care. He's like, do you know what? Yes, I would actually love to tuck into those leftovers. So if you're not going to eat them, I will happily take them off your hands. So John goes out to the car. Judy's sitting patiently in the passenger side waiting to go. And just as he reaches for the door handle, two deafening bangs echo across the whole car park. Just bang, bang, gunshots and then silence. And Judy is crouched down, ducked down in her car seat, momentarily frozen. And then she realises it's silent and she cautiously and slowly emerges from the vehicle and she sees John face down on the ground with blood pooling around his head and his shoulders. He's after being shot in the back of the head at point blank range. Just brutal execution style. He didn't have a chance and he is dead. So Judy calls the police. Jeff, the office manager inside, has heard this and he calls the police as well. And Judy says that she didn't even hear any altercation. She just heard shots. She ducked down out of reflex and she kind of got a little bit of a peek over her shoulder. But all she could make out was someone in all dark clothing running away into the night. She didn't really get a look at any face. She didn't hear any voices. She didn't hear any words exchanged. And the police immediately dismiss the idea that this was just a random robbery because although his wallet was taken he was still wearing his Rolex watch and the police were not stupid they could put two and two together they were very quick to conclude that this was no random act of violence this was no accident this is somebody who was targeted And there was obviously some level of planning that went into this because they knew to take the wallet and hope that it would just be dismissed as a robbery gone wrong. But they were dumb enough and inexperienced enough to not take the Rolex. So yeah, it didn't seem to be about money, shall we say. So immediately Judy becomes a person of interest because number one, she was there. And number two, she's the spouse. So anytime there is, you know, a murder, they always look at the spouse, don't they? But they cleared her pretty early on in the investigation. And also Jeff, the manager who was there at the scene, he became a person of interest, particularly because when they went to check the CCTV footage around that car park, all of those cameras were out. So yeah, coincidental. However, Judy kind of nearly cleared him because she saw a figure running away. So it couldn't have been Jeff because Jeff was still on the scene and Jeff also made a call to the police. So the police then had to dig into the life of the Parkers and it quickly became a game of clue because John hadn't been the most savoury of characters. So when you're looking at the victimology and trying to decide who would have a motive, I mean, who didn't have a motive, (laughs) to be quite honest. And as time went by, police were just, they were getting leads and then it was coming up empty. The company J&J Parker even were offering a reward. I mean, 
I don't know where they were getting this money. They were practically bankrupt, but they were offering a reward for any information that would lead to an arrest. So this appeal actually made it all the way across to the next town over where a police officer in a neighbouring precinct remembered something from a couple of months ago that might be of interest. He had questioned two young men, two juveniles, who had been resident at this local boys home for, you know, those homes for wayward youths. And one had since been released. But basically there was an incident where these boys had been caught with contraband and they were turned over to the police for questioning but the contraband that they were caught with was a sum of money that they weren't able to explain. Now these kids were teenagers and at the risk of getting into more serious trouble they decided that they're just going to divulge the source of the funds and they told the police officer that there's a kid that they knew who had approached them and offered them $1,500 each to take care of somebody. Now, I don't know what kind of junior mafia movie this is out of, but cute, okay? So basically, they said that they had absolutely zero intention of killing anybody. But they saw this kid as a bit of a joke. They described this kid as trying to act, you know, real gangster, like he he came from nothing. But in, in actual fact, this kid who dressed like a hoodlum and pretended as though he came from the rough side of town was pretty much just a phony and he lived in a really nice house. He had plenty of cash and he came from a really nice family. So the boys thought, easy money. Yeah, definitely kid. We will take your money. We'll sort out your problem for you. And they were just going to pocket the cash and kind of give deuces. Like they had zero intention of completing this contract, if you want to call it that. And in their words, like, well, what was he going to do about it? Was he going to call the police on us? And that kid's name, in case we haven't sussed it out by now, was Daniel. It was Daniel Parker was allegedly soliciting these two teenage boys to take his money and take care of that person. And look, these boys had alibis. It was cleared, like they had absolutely no involvement in this shooting. So the the cops had no worries, no concerns, no suspicions that they were involved in this at all. It was very clear that they had just scammed this rich kid out of his money. But they did kind of say, okay, well, we probably are going to need to go ahead and talk to Daniel because this doesn't really bode well for him. So they bring Daniel in for questioning. And remember, he's a minor. He's only 15 at the time. So Judy has to give permission for him to be questioned without a lawyer. And she's no issue with this whatsoever. She accompanies him to the station. And Daniel cracked like a cheap heel. He admitted straight away that, yes, I did try to pay some boys, but it was only to break John's legs. They weren't going to kill anybody, nor did Daniel, you know, intend for them to kill anybody. But he was trying to solicit someone to, you know, teach a lesson, if you like. And he told the police all about the harsh discipline, the intimidation that he and his siblings were experiencing at the hands of John. And that he, like that, just wanted to make it stop. He wanted John to know what it felt like to be picked on and he wanted him to back off. Judy, at this point, hearing this information is horrified and is now having second thoughts about that lawyer. So they end the interview and she retains counsel for Daniel. She still allowed him though to be interviewed numerous times at their home, but just with counsel present because it was very clear that Daniel couldn't hold his water. (laughs) So she just didn't want him getting himself in any more trouble than he was already in. But actually they came up, you know, with empty hands. It was a dead end. There was nothing, there was no evidence tying Daniel to this, to this murder. So a year actually passed by and the family decided, you know what, it's time to, to leave Indiana. And Daniel moved to Arizona to live with his biological dad. Remember Roy? Yeah, he moved back with Roy. Judy moved back to Michigan but only with the two youngest girls because Christina was actually pregnant at the time with her boyfriend and she wanted to stay behind in Indiana with him and get married. So although the case was kind of going cold the police weren't ready to give up just yet and they decided to maybe trace the family back to their time in Michigan because maybe there will be some answers there where it all began. And they started to interview former colleagues and employees who John had, you know, so abruptly screwed out of a job. And one piece of information in particular 
stood out to the police. And that was the speculation that had kind of run rampant amongst the ex-employees. That the reason that the move was so abruptly made was because our sweet, innocent Judy had been having an affair in the office with an employee and that John had caught them red-handed. He had seen it on the cameras. And the ex-employees were speculating that this kind of was the reason why that John was spinning out so much near the end of his time in Michigan. And he was drinking and smoking and letting his appearance go to shit. And he was aggressive with everyone. He was always in a bad mood and him and Judy were fighting in the office. Perfect sense. So yeah, the police kind of hearing this thought, we never heard this before. Judy never mentioned any of this before. Let's go talk to Judy and let's follow up on this and get a bit more information on that situation. Because if it is the case that Judy was having some sordid affair with an employee in Michigan and, you know, John shut down that business, screwed them all out of a job and moved her away, cutting off the lover cold turkey, this could be a potential suspect. So we're going to need to know more. But when they went to question Judy in Michigan, something even more interesting became apparent Judy and her two youngest girls were not living alone in Michigan. They they had a housemate. They had a roommate, a new member of the family. Do you remember the office manager, Jeff, that was there at the scene? Yeah, apparently Jeff and Judy had become really close after, you know, the murder. And Jeff decided that when they were relocating to Michigan, he was going to relocate with them because they didn't want people gossiping. They knew how it would look and people wouldn't understand. They were just trauma bonded, if you like. But when the police followed up with the Indiana employees, there was actually some rumblings. There were some whispers about Jeff and Judy long before that. So people weren't really surprised to hear that they were now together. And there was actually speculation that John had suspected something was going on between Jeff and Judy before he died. So it doesn't look great, but again, there was just no evidence tying either Judy or Jeff to this. And then shortly after this, out of the clear blue sky, the police got some new tips that they had never gotten before and it sent them in an entirely different direction. So this time the tips came in from two young girls called Anna and Sarah. And Anna and Sarah had gone to school with Daniel and Christina. And these two girls used to spend a lot of time in the house. They were mostly friends with Daniel. But in the time that they spent in the Parker household, they had overheard some phone conversations in and around the time of this murder. And the things that they had overheard were kind of pointing to Christina. And they were almost certain that they had heard something about Christina hiding a gun underneath the back deck. And they had thought, you know given that there had just been a shooting in the family, that that was a bit weird and it kind of stayed with them. Now, (laughs) the police understandably were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Are you honestly saying that someone was shot in this family and you had this information and you never thought to come forward and tell us this? But when they were pressed as to why they never divulged this information before, The girls kind of confessed that they were terrified of Christina and that in high school, Christina was a scary person. They described her as volatile, as a bully, someone who would vandalise other students' cars, lockers, belongings. She would get into physical altercations. She kept really unsavoury company, shall we say. And she used to do drugs with these people. So they were basically painting a very alarming picture of Christina. They were painting a picture not just of a 17 year old girl who was acting out but someone who was this intimidating aggressor that people were afraid of. And of course on this tip the police then followed up with other classmates of Christina's from that time and they all pretty much corroborated what Anna and Sarah had said. Christina was pretty scary in school and they also found out that Christina had in fact secured a gun in and around this time. She had purchased a gun. Now, they weren't sure what kind of gun she had purchased, but they just knew that she wanted it for, you know, target shooting out in a field behind the house just to blow off steam. But it was all kind of hearsay. There was nothing solid to go on. They even went and they dug up underneath the deck. Remember, Anna and Sarah had you know, believed that they overheard something about a gun being hidden under the deck. So nothing was found and they had absolutely nothing to 
substantiate any of the gossip about Christina and this gun. So they were kind of at another dead end until finally a lucky break happened. So remember we said that Christina was kind of into drugs in high school? Well, that continued into adulthood. And remember we said that she was pregnant and got married? Well, her husband was apparently also kind of into drugs and he had been arrested a couple of times just for some minor drug charges. But as fate would have it, as they were hitting another dead end with this Christina information, Christina's husband got picked up on some minor drug charges and it was his third strike potentially and they were in a three strike state. That is so hard to say. (laughs) So basically when you're in a three strike state, as far as I understand, you know, whether they're minor or not, if it's your third one, you get a really, really hefty custodial sentence. So yeah, no bueno. This is not good news for him. I think his name was Eric. Anyway, it doesn't matter what his name is. He's Christina's husband and the police are now seizing the opportunity to get him to play ball and give them some information about his wife and what really happened to her stepdad, John Parker. And the husband is more than happy to give information and he tells the police, Daniel did it. Her brother Daniel did it. Just like that, he he solved the crime. And the police are stunned. They're like, hold on, Daniel did this? This doesn't make sense. Like, there's so many missing pieces here. We're going to need this from Christina's own mouth. So you're going to wear this wire. You're going to go home and act like everything is fine. And you're going to find a way to get Christina to tell the truth on tape. So the husband straps on the wire and goes home to Christina. Now, He's not exactly a smooth criminal and he's not a great liar because he walks through the door and as soon as he walks through the door to his wife, Christina, he cracks, he confesses, he tells her, I'm wearing a wire. They're trying to get you to confess to everything that happened with John and I'm so sorry, but just don't say anything. And actually, surprisingly, Christina just says, do you know what? it's time and it's time that I just come clean and I'm going to go into the police. I'm going to hand myself in and I'm going to tell them everything. After all of these years of twists and turns and the police running themselves in circles, I'm just going to walk into the police station and I'm going to tell them everything, the full truth. And that is exactly what she did. So at this point, you're probably wondering, okay, so who was it? Was it Christina? Was it Daniel? Was it Judy? And the answer is yes. Yes, it was. All of the above. It was all of them. So let's rewind. November 2002, six months before the murder. The family is, they're miserable. They're in free fall, emotionally, financially, every which way. And Judy now has her sights set on a new man, Jeff. And she wants John out of the picture. But John has conditioned this family, including Judy, to fear losing their nice home, their nice things, the financial security that he brings. So she starts kind of approaching the kids about, you know, she's been thinking of getting a divorce. And if we get a divorce, mom and dad, you're going to have to choose somebody to live with. So if that happened, you know, who would you prefer to live with? And the kids recall this conversation. Now, I don't understand why you would bring that to the children before you've actually finalized anything with your spouse. But I suppose she's done weirder things when it comes to the kids. I mean, she watched her 11 year old get beaten with a belt. So Judy's probably not mother of the year at this point, but she starts planting the seed with the kids. And of course, the kids like her have been conditioned to fear poverty, to fear losing everything. But apparently Judy more than any of them, because God forbid she economizes here or be shamed for her multiple affairs, because John has told her if she ever does go ahead and try and divorce him, not only will he take all of the money and she's not going to get a penny, but he's also going to release the videotapes that he has of her back in Michigan having the affair in the office because he's told her multiple times, I have tapes, I still have those tapes and I'm going to hang on to those tapes in case I ever need to use them and publicly shame you. So yeah, Judy doesn't really want to be embarrassed, nor does she want to be poor. So in her mind, the most logical solution here would be just to have John killed. I mean, that's probably the easiest thing. It makes the most sense. And if you're thinking, God, what an evil sociopath, just hang on because it gets worse. It gets so much worse. 
because Judy calls a family meeting, which comprises of herself, Christina and David. And she kind of tells them this. She tells them this thought process that she's been going through and she lays out this plan to her 15 and 17 year old children like a sales pitch. And she tells them, listen, we don't want to continue like this, do we? You don't like the way things are going. And of course, the kids don't like the way things are going. They're living with an abusive stepfather who they don't feel treats them as equal children to the biological kids. So they're miserable. They're unhappy. Of course, they don't want this. And then Judy tells them that there's a life policy on John worth a million dollars. So, I mean, it would make sense for him to be bumped off because then we wouldn't have to worry about money. And not only does she let the kids in on her thought process on what her plan is, she actively makes them part of the planning and the preparation for this. So she totally just makes them co-conspirators and she has them running around town like trying to solicit murder for hire contracts. Like she's the one who gave Daniel the thousands of dollars to go and try and get those two kids to, you know, teach John a lesson. Yeah, it was actually supposed to be for murder. And they weren't the only ones because (laughs) they are running around town just handing over money to anybody who says that they will do a murder for hire. And these people have zero intentions of actually following through on it, but they just know that here's a bunch of stupid people offering me free cash. And they're losing thousands of dollars. They're being scammed again and again and again to the point where Judy kind of finally realizes, "Uh uh-oh, John is going to start to notice that our bank account is depleting at a really alarming rate. There is thousands of dollars that has just disappeared over the last couple of months. So Judy makes the executive decision that they can't keep going like this. This is totally unsustainable and they're just going to have to go ahead and do the murder themselves. But does Judy volunteer to do this herself? No, she appoints Daniel, her 15-year-old child. She decides that it's best if he goes and commits murder at 15 years of age so that she can get a million dollar life insurance policy and they don't have to be poor. So yeah. And then she decides that her 17 year old child, Christina, is the best gal to go and get a gun because she probably knows the right people. So she gives Christina a bunch of cash to go and buy a gun. And she's also going to be in charge, Christina, of destroying all the evidence. So Yeah, basically all of the dirty work, the, you know, the heavy lifting in this criminal conspiracy, they have to be done by the kids because if anything were to go wrong and they were to get caught, the chances are the kids would probably take the fall and Judy then could just run off into the sunset with her new boy toy, Jeff, and a million quid in her back pocket. I mean, it's disgusting. So the police, after hearing all of this, their jaws are on the floor and they kind of go, Right, well, I suppose the next steps are to go and pick up Daniel. So they go to Arizona because, as we remember, Daniel has moved with his biological dad, Roy, which I can kind of understand why that happened now. And they pull into the driveway and Daniel is getting out of his car and he just puts his hands up. He doesn't even resist. He doesn't even ask why they're there. He's just ready to confess everything. And he goes with them, he attends the police station and his story lines up nearly identically with Christina's. So the whole idea of John and Judy going out to dinner that night to talk about, you know, parenting going forward was basically all a sham. And this was all a ploy to get him to the decided location where this murder was going to take place. The CCTV cameras had been tampered with ahead of time so that nothing was captured Daniel, who was at home with his three sisters and he was up in bed sulking because he was grounded, he wasn't actually in his room. He had snuck out and he was waiting in the bushes beside the J&J Parker Limited car park, knowing that John and Judy were going to be there at a certain time because there was no homework. There was no homework left behind in the offices. This was, again, part of the plan. So when Judy called home, she knew that Christina was going to give her this chestnut about the homework left behind. That was going to give her an opportunity to get John to the offices where Daniel was waiting to do the shooting. And then when Daniel fled the scene, Christina was waiting with trash bags out at the back door to gather all of his clothes, the wallet, the gun, 
and basically just destroy all the evidence. So yeah, Daniel sat and told his whole version of the story and like I said, it lined up identically with Christina's. So they knew that they had them. But the police weren't so confident that Judy will be as willing to give herself up because she seemed to have the most to lose. She had this lovely new life after all of that and she had a million quid. She was with her new partner and they decided, okay, we're we're not going to be able to just show up there and arrest her. We're going to have to get Daniel to try and walk her into this. So they get Daniel to call Judy up and try and get her to say something incriminating. So Daniel calls up Judy and says, ma'am, I'm freaking out. Christina's turned on us. She's after telling them everything. I don't know what I'm going to do. What do I say? Help me. And Judy says, Daniel, I don't know what you're talking about, but maybe we could talk later in person. And then the call drops. She hangs up. And I don't know why I was surprised at this point. I was screaming at my television. I could not believe she had sold her kids down the river like that. I don't know why I'm surprised. It was very obvious from the way that she assigned them the roles in this murder that she was planning to sell them down the river if anything ever did go awry with their plan. But yeah, it was it was still shocking nonetheless. And the two kids' testimony was pretty much a nail in the coffin anyway it was more than enough to get them all found guilty and I think by the end of it there was so much evidence like there the two kids didn't even try to plead not guilty Judy did for a while but she eventually just pled guilty in 2009 which was what like six years after this had happened so it took six years to get to the truth of what happened that night And Christina was given five years. So she did obviously cooperate. She did give them everything. It's hard to say that whether or not this would have ever truly been solved if Christina hadn't have just come forward. But she did get released early. She got released after two and a half years. And she actually died of a drug overdose very shortly after she was released. She left behind two little kids, which is just so unfair for those two little kids. So yeah, Christina died at the age of 27. Danny got 23 years. He was sentenced to 23 years, but he's actually out. He got out in 2016 and there's no trace of him. He kind of just went off the grid, which I understand. You've murdered someone and you murdered someone at the behest of your mother in order to get you and your mother and your sisters out of an abusive situation. And you did this when you were 15. Like, it's just... Yeah, like it doesn't take away the fact that he took a life, but it's a very complex one. I really, really think I could go down a rabbit hole and debate that with myself. The voices in my head could debate that one. But Judy was given the longest sentence and I'm delighted because I bet she didn't see that one coming when she was planning this and, you know, assigning all of the jobs to the kids. So she got 33 years. Now, she was up for parole last year. I don't know what happened with that. I can't see any updates on whether or not she was granted parole. I hope she's still in there and frankly I hope she rots in there till the very bitter end because you can't fix a sociopath so why let them out? Why let them roam society amongst the rest of us? And not only did she put a plan in motion that took someone's life, She stole the lives of her children. So she involved two of her minor children in a murder conspiracy. She had one of them physically pull a trigger. And then think about the two youngest kids. They now have no dad. They essentially have no mom because she's rotting in prison. And their two older siblings got hauled off to prison as well. And now one of them is dead. And for what? So that she could run away into the sunset with some fancy guy with a million quid in her back pocket to start her new life. And people that evil do not change. So yeah, what can I say? Fuck Judy Parker. But anyway, that was it. That was the case of John and Judy Parker. I hope you all have a really lovely long weekend and you enjoy your Easter eggs if you are celebrating. But that is it for me for this weekend. I will be back again on Monday to talk about Married at First Sight Australia. So until then, have a lovely weekend, guys.